you want to do that? Hallelujah. Abba, Father, we bless your name, Yahuwah. We're so grateful to be together here today on your Moed, seeking your understanding and wisdom, your spirit, the Ruach in us, and having our, knit, our hearts knit together more and more as we become Mishbuka. We pray a blessing over Eric's teaching that you would cause understanding in us. Revelation understanding. And uh, hallelujah. We bless your name. Amen. And Eric, I have been privileged to learn from you on YouTube. And now I finally get to meet you. And uh, I'm grateful to be here and learn with this group. Thanks for coming this way to be. You bet. Seven. The Hebrew word for seven is spelled Shin Bet Ayin, which, does anybody know why, besides the people who really know, we open it up to everybody else, does anybody know why they say that seven is the perfect number, or the number of God, or the heavenly number? Donald? Because it's because God rested on the seventh day. Okay, he did rest on the seventh day, but why did he choose day number seven? That might be another inverse way of looking at it. Does anybody else want to venture a guess? That was the day he finished his work and rested. Yes, he did, but why would? He, why do you suppose he might have chosen that number seven? Or, let me put it this way, why do you suppose the number seven is spelled Shin Berayin? Why? Why do people say that seven is the holy number, the perfect number, the kind of set apart I ideal, if it's seven, okay, that, that's good, that's, that's, a, that's fully there. I mean, he did rest on the seventh day, he did say the seventh day was kadosh, which is to say set apart, but why should it be, could have been the eighth day, the ninth day, I mean, why would he, why did he pick seven, any, any clues? So for, you might have the refined container of understanding. The container so of refined understanding. What what Linda's doing here is is saying that because this is fire or teeth, it's you could say it's equivalent, or you could put in the idea of refined. Because if you put metal say into a refiner's fire, the dross gets burned out, comes to the surface, scraped off. That which is impure, which is not metal, gold, silver, is easily discernible, determinable. And so the fire is a cleansing agent. And then you said this is, what did you say that was? A container. Container. Or house. Container or house. And then what's the iron? Understanding, wisdom, insight. Because ion is an eyeball, let's, let's say insight. So, how would you put these together? You want to venture a guess, Shari? If you had three concepts, you're suddenly in the class. Hello. If you were to package these three items, the benefit from being in the class is you can speak out. If you were to package these three things, if you were to make a recipe, you're, you're cooking a, a meal, 
and you take these three spices and you blend them together so that the synergistic effect of the three, the, the sum of the three is greater than the sum of the parts individually, right? Synergy. So if you were to put these three together, you've got okay. refining you have mustard on your shirt now. a container and insight. What, what, what do you suppose you might end up with? Olive. Excuse me? The olive cut. How so? How do you? How would you explain that? Um, just the effect of the um, the entire story spelled out in the olive bet in a synopsis, uh, refining um, in a container. Um, so you're saying the olive bet here, just as kind of a shorthand, I use A B olive bet. The Aleph bet is a container which refines us or breaks things down, chews things up as you take a word and put it into elemental individual letters, like the table of elements, all compounds and matters composed of each individual atom. So the elements of all matter is the letters of the Aleph bet, as we discussed the other day, being the word of John 1.1. 1, 1. So you're saying that the that insight of chopping up the letters of the contained in the alphabet, is that what you're talking about? That's kind of where I was going, yeah. I don't, I don't know that I could do it any better than that either. <laughs> Anybody else have a different perspective? Do you have a sheen bed iron? Perfect, the perfection inside understanding, or the, the the perfect container of understanding, the perfect housing, the, the perfect understanding okay, in so the house. You, so you could say the perfect understanding of the Aleph bet comes by insight, but ion is more than insight. See, I just gave one word. Mm -hmm. If you look at the word for ion in the dictionary, Ion is a word, it's not just the name of the letter. So the word means to weigh carefully, balance exactly, to determine. So it's, it's, it's not a casual regard, it's, it's really getting in there to, to perceive insight. But it's also the word for a fountain or a spring, that, like this geyser that shoots up. And it's the visible part of what would be a gleam or a sparkle, noticing the sparkly stones on the path, or looking last night there was a meteor shower, and noticed a few just sitting there looking and looking and looking. Every once in a while, she wouldn't shoot across. The clouds came in and didn't see it. But here's another thing you can do. Besides just looking at that and trying to make sense of it that we just did, there's a couple other ways to decipher the word. One way is to take bet ion as a word and look that up, and the other one is sheen bet as a word. Now, another thing we can do, which we're not going to get into too much on just this one word because we're going to look at this, is put prefix letters in front and suffix letters back here and go through the dictionary. That's the benefit of the red dictionary. Does anybody know what bet ion happens to mean? If you were to see some kind of a container that was kind of like an eyeball, what, what, what comes to your mind to picture? What, what, do you, what, what kind of picture comes to mind? Well, the bet container is a house. Okay. Is that a living house? Well, ion is n not living. They, they usually Awake, associate... Active. Uh, excuse me? Active. Active. That's noon, typically. Ion is a eyeball. Remember, it's like a, 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 a fruit. It's like there's this fruit with a seed in it, it, or it's like an eyeball with a pupil in it, but it's this just another way to see it. It's a, it's a round thing, right? What's a round container? Imagine it floating. Balloon. A balloon. A bubble. And what? If you see a bubble down in LA, there's the La Brea tar pits. Because of the 
gases down underneath the surface, they work to the surface and you'll see them percolating, bubbling, still active even in the days of the dinosaurs. There are saber-toothed cats and mastodons, bones in there, but you'll see these bubbles come to the surface and it's really interesting. The word bet ion means to bubble or to come up from deep to the surface and become exposed. That ion is on page 78 of the Red Dictionary. But there's no word uh, just bet ion. So this is one of the ways that this works. If you are looking for a word and it's a two letter, you can double the second letter and make it the third so you end up with bet ion ion. Or you can put a yod or a vav in between. We, we talked about this before. There's a bunch of different things you can do. Put prefixes and suffixes. But just, just so you know, the word bet ion, bet ion, which would be pronounced kind of like baba, baba, like bubble, bubbling, literally means to bubble. But it also means it gushed out or he struggled in the river. He struggled in the river. Now, we don't necessarily have a picture of that here and now in this era of this country, but in Africa, if you're in the river and an alligator gets a hold of you, or you're, there's all this frothy bubbles as you know, the, the two are seeing who's going to be lunch. And I've heard of that things ha those things happening. But it's also a pustule or a vesicle bubbling, bet ion, bet vav ion. Bet ion hay to seek or ask questions. Because when we're seeking or asking questions, it's something from within us is bubbling out up and compelling us to struggle in the river for our life. Which is why I'm doing this. I'm struggling for my life, my sanity, my sense of why are we here? What's happening to this country? What's, if you can read world history, where are we on the prophetic map of eschatology? There's, there's a lot. That's a whole other subject. But the point is, he, uh, Aramaic Syriac, he sought, desired, prayed, or inquired. So when Yeshua said, ask, and it will be given unto you, Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. That's all contained in this word, bet I am. It's not just a house of insights. But if you want to find where the insight that you're searching for is contained, what has to happen is from deep within you, if you crave to know the truth, you could sit here and just casually regard it or disregard it, and there's probably some pretty good cartoons on right now that you could go watch. You don't have to sit here. It's not, it's not like you're going to burn in hell if you don't learn Hebrew. I say that kind of, you know, nonchalantly, but I've kind of been accused of saying that. I'm not saying that. That's why I'm saying that. We get to have cake instead of stale bread. Get to have cake instead of stale bread? I, I would equate this, the taste of this, is like the challah bread. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the sweet, pleasant bread. Challah also means health, besides sweet and pleasant. And it's braided because that's the word for to give high regard and esteem. So typically, I don't know what girls think about with their hair, but typically when they braid their hair, that's like, oh, I'm going to really do it up nice. Is that kind of the, at least that's what the word means in Hebrew. So when you braid something, like some people braid their sitiot, it's just, that's the stuff we were given. That's what we do. You know, we use the stuff that we were handed, the elements of our life, and then maybe it changes in different cultures. But if you look at the word Gedol, Gimel Dalit Lamed or Gimel Dalit Vav Lamed, you'll see that it's braided and festoons and ribbons and such things. To seek, ask questions, was searched out, was uncovered, uncovered or discovered, to swell with desire. So, 
My point is, by reading the dictionary with related words, and I could, put, I could spend the time to look at other prefixes and suffixes, but we're not going to go there. I'm trying to make a point. Swelling with desire. And then if you look at Sheen Bet, does anybody know what Sheen Bet? It, it would be pronounced Shev. Do you, do you know the song that one phrase goes, Shev Vedachim Gam Yacha? To dwell. Shev, Shevet, they put a Tav. But, but that's the word Shabbat. Tav is a suffix, the root word is Shev. But Shev is also an old man. Why would the word dwell be also an old man? Anybody want to venture a guess? What we're doing here is suffering. I'm trying to give you the experience as we did the last time of looking at a bunch of words and trying to figure out what they mean. We're going to do that with this. And here we're taking all this time just to do one three-letter word. But I'm saying this is suffering. There's a reason why we're doing this. We'll show you because the word sefer is this word right here. Isn't there another, another place? Here. And if you really want to know what it means to suffer, we could break down that word and do the exact same thing that we're doing here. But it all depends on how much time we have in order to stay to the point and keep, keep you swelling with desire. We'll, we'll continue with this. So anyway, the word for sheen bet is old man, because sheen bet is also the word where we get shu, if you put a sheen bav bet, that's S-H, the U sound, and the V, shu, reading that way, which is where we, if we put a tav in front of it, and a hey here, it's teshuva. And teshuva means to return which is not just to turn around or not just find an alternative. So if somebody says, repent, oh, I've been going this way and I better go another way. Is that a repentance? Well, kind of. You're sorry you did that. But there's something about, I think it might be Michael Rudo who was talking about this. But the point is, somebody else has elaborated quite a bit that the, what he's telling us to do is go back to where we started. Go back to the original place. That's the repentance. So that's a concept which has become a doctrine. So various Christian denominations have their own interpretation. They're welcome to do that. The, the Jews might have their t interpretation of Teshuvah. They're welcome to do that too. But if you're doing a word study and you want to find out what does this imply, then I have to look at why does Sheen Bet mean an old man and Shuv have to do with return. Red, how many times, not that you're the old man, but how many times have you done Sukkot? Ten. Ten. So he keeps coming back trips around the sun, as it were. Every trip around the sun, and more trips around the sun, it's like, that's, that's how old? You know, the older guy is the guy that keeps coming back. The other interesting thing about to return, we mentioned this word the other day, is het, zion, yod, resh, as I believe the word. And it's the word to, it's one who returns. Chazir. But it's also the word for pig. Does anybody want to take a guess why the word pig is literally the word for one who returns? Because they return back to eat pretty much anything, even what they might have left behind. That's right. And what other animals are left <clears throat> behind. They clean up the barnyard pretty nicely. Pigs eat the things that the other animals have deposited. It's one who, yeah, the extra, they turn around and eat that stuff which was left there. So when the prodigal son was feeding the pigs, grocery stores, even to this day, are not allowed to give food to the homeless. All the food, which is perfectly ripe, they, they don't want to sell it, it's perfectly ripe. They'll sell things just before ripe so people can take it home. 
it'll be right by the time it's there tomorrow, but perfectly ripe food they have to throw away. And if you give that to the pigs, it's like, man, this is the best stuff. So the prodigal son sitting there taking this food and giving it to the pigs, he's going, man, I could w wish I could eat this. This is the, this is the best food ever because he's working for a wealthy man. If he said, I wish I could eat the food of this pig, he was actually thinking in Hebrew thoughts, according to the words, I wish I could eat the food of one who returns. Returns where? Teshuva. It's, it's a synonym. It's, a, it's like this game of word connections. And he says, why don't I return to my father's house so I can eat the food on his table? And I will eat the food of one who returns. It, it, in the Hebrew mind, it all fits together if you look at Hebrew words. So that's one way that you can tell that that story was told in Hebrew, not in English or Greek or some other language, unless those other languages have retained the word, word value. So Paul said at one time, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Where's the Hebrew word play there? Anybody know? It's in the word sleep and changed. Uh, See, in English, those are completely different words. But in Hebrew, the word is shana, like shana tova, the word for year. It's where the year changes, something changes. But it's also the word to sleep. So he says, we will, we will not all shana, but we will all shana. It's the same exact word. So you can tell that Paul was messing around with Hebrew, but now that's where the vowel points or the, you know, the dots or that changes it. Shene shenat, shari sherry. It's the exact same thing. Big difference, right? There was another verse I mentioned the other day where uh, Yahweh is, is talking to Zechariah, I think it was, and he says, "What do you see?" And he says, "I see an almond tree." And Yahweh says, very well. Indeed, I am industrious and diligent about what I say. When I say, Aleph, boom, 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 it will talk. Whatever I say is going to happen. And I'm industrious and diligent to make so. Why would he say that? Does anybody want to venture a guess? If, if he sees an almond tree, why does Yahuwah say, even so, I will be, I am industrious and diligent about what I speak and what I, what I do? Okay, I have to call on you because uh, the word for almond tree is sheen kuf dalit. You have any ideas there? Wow. Sheen no, it's the same word. Dalit. It's the exact same word. Sheen kuf, just so you know, is, a, is, is pronounced S Q sack, so it's a bag or sackcloth. It's also a check. Um, it's also Sheen kuf aleph is leg or water carrier. Regal is also leg. Sheen kuf hay, and I'm taking off the dalit and looking at just these two letters by adding other suffix letters. Sheen kuf hay is the word to cause to drink. And then you can put a noon in front of it, and you realize noon shin kuf is the word for kissed, to kiss. So there's a verse where it says when Esau finally met up with his brother Yaakov, and he had armed men, I think there's 300 or something of them coming, and Jacob thought, man, I'm dead. And he uh, gives a gift of some flocks first, and then he brings his the children of Leah, and then he and with, with Rachel, and then he comes and he bows before Esau. And it says, Esau fell on his neck and kissed him. And that word kissed has dots above it. So to bring attention to that word, it's like, what's going on here? Well, I've heard it said that some rabbis have said that they don't know why those dots are above that word, but it means he wanted to bite him. <laughs> those, those dots are teeth marks. But instead of biting him, he was all, all of a sudden overwhelmed and he kissed him. But if you look in the dictionary under the word for kissed, it's not the word kissed. It's the word to give a drink. Watered. Moistened. Refreshed. 
How do you spell the word for kissed? Kissed is noon sheen kaf, and this word here is sheen kaf hey. So what I'm bringing to your attention is that if you're reading in scripture, and you see the spelling of the word one way, and you look in the dictionary and it's not there, what you need to do is put other prefixes and suffixes on it and find where the root of the word is. And even if you don't think it's a prefix or a suffix, try to, try to drop other letters on, and what you end up with is pages and pages and books of word analysis. And some of it seems like it just is besides the point, doesn't matter, but that's not so. It's None of it's besides the point. Every word you sit down and you analyze and you look and you wrap your mind around it and you are percolating, bubbling. The desire that's swelling up within you is the desire to know what he said and what he meant by it. What did he mean? You can look at translations it will tell you what he said, maybe, hopefully, probably, but only by your swelling with desire and returning to the instructions given originally. Remember the other day, what was the word? Um, Psalms 24. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. The word lift up is uh, shin alifav. Nasa. It's nasa, but the, the way it appeared here didn't have the new. It's just vav, shin vav, aleph, I believe it was, what it was. And it's the same word, just for those who weren't here, it was the same word for those do not lift up his name unto vanity, used in Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments. So the idea of being able to, to pick up something, well, that's now making it yours, at least for a while while you're carrying it. Don't carry his name as empty. Some people say, well, that means we should proclaim his name. And other people say, no, we should so highly regard his name that we never say it. If you never say his name, does that bring it to emptiness? Not necessarily. You're not verbalizing it because of the high regard, the weight. The weight is the word kavod. See, uh, Samit Lamed is the word for light and easy. But it's also the word for, hey, this is not difficult. Sure, I, sure I'm, 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 I'm in there with that. But Samit Lamed also can mean, this is worthless, whatever. So in Hebrew, the same exact word can mean this, but it's opposite, that. And it's like, wow, what is it? Ponder it. Selah also means to stop and think and meditate. Which is exactly what this word means. The same word, which is hey, hey bet yotet, when that noon psalmic was lifted up by Moshe, but that psalmic noon is the burning, hey psalmic noon, hey is the burning bush. And Yeshua equated himself as the noon, the living one, on the psalmic, the, the crucifix, that if he be lifted up, and if we look believing, does he mean just give a glance? Yep, got that. Okay, I'm saved. Let's go. Or does he mean ponder and think? But what did they have to do when the, when the, the, the vipers were biting the people and Moshe was instructed to put this serpentine shape, kind of like this bronze rag. It wasn't a snake he made. It was a serpentine shape of bronze. And the noon is kind of this serpent sort of a shape on a pole that would, whoever would, hey, bet yo tet. And that's, in the dictionary, translated as gaze. Gaze, beholding, contemplating, meditating, pondering, appreciating. Like getting to know somebody. It takes time. How long do you suppose they had to sit there and stare at that psalmic, that noon psalmic before the snake bite poison dissipated? Whoever looked at that was healed. Yeshua said, whoever looks at him lifted up will be saved unto eternal life. But is it just say the sinner's prayer and you're in, or is it pondering? Just for what it's worth, if you add a, another suffix by duplicating the second letter of bet tet and making it bet tet tet batat 
If you put a he in front of it, that's where we get the word, sounds just like it in Hebrew, habitat, which is the surrounding environment. So perhaps the way to look at something is not just it itself, but itself, yes, but also a secondary way in, in regards to its habitat, its surrounding. Well, if you look at each letter, that's one thing, but its habitat and surrounding is all the other letters in regard to its chronological ordinal sequence. So, what is a bet? It's a reference to the Aleph and the Gimel. What's a sonnet? The letters before it and after it are the Nun and the Ayin, and even if you look at just those three letters, if you expand it and push it out to the full gamut of the Aleph bet, it'll give you this other understanding of what's a sonnet. So what I'm saying, I'm trying to show you because Josh, you, you had asked about how do we go about processing this stuff, right? Suffering, how do you do that? And I'm trying to show you the very practical step-by-step -step sort of things to pull in. And then you can say, well, give me a list. It's like, well, I could give you a list, but you can also just follow the track of your own mind as something comes to mind, run it down. You might start with one word, kind of like the way I do this, and next thing you know, you're down this rabbit trail for the next three hours. And you never got back to what you were first going to look at. Like, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's the banyan tree picture, right? You know, the branch becomes the root, becomes another branch, becomes another forest. It's like, gosh, you can't tell what's connected to what because they're all connected. And there's no regimen of you must follow. It's just not there. So to go in the wind of the Ruach, you just say, maybe he's leading you this way, that way. Maybe he's conducting this breathe, that scent, this, oh, hey, what about the... And then somebody calls you on the phone, oh, they're distracted. No, maybe they're particularly giving you like that seed in the wind, like the bubble. But it all goes back to, like Psalms 24, reevaluate, pick up and carry the high regard, that word... Rash, rashon or Rashid is the primary, preliminary origin way back in the very beginning. The very beginning when he gave Adam. But there was another beginning with Noah. And there was another beginning with Abraham. Another beginning with Moshe and David. I mean, there's all these beginnings that we can go back and regard. So the old man who goes back to the beginning to find the insight where is the pure, clean house. The letter bet isn't just house, but it also means to be taught, trained, and domesticated. Whose house? What house? Bet follows Aleph. Aleph refers to Elohim, the, the one who spoke, the one who's causing this all to exist. So it's Elohim's house. To be taught, trained, and domesticated of Elohim's house, we go back and we look at the original stuff he said with the desire for insight. Why? Because the word spelled Shin bet ayin not only is the number seven, but it's the word foul. And it's the word curse. And it's the word that says if you don't keep the vow, you get the curse. And it also means satisfied. Kind of like the word shalom. And it means overflowing. And it is the picture where it says in another place that Yahweh has one way of doing things. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. And if you look at the dictionary meanings of the word Shabbat, it's all those things. So the number seven not only means vow or curse, or what happens to you if you don't keep the vow, but it's also a picture of this is the way he does stuff. It's an expression of his heart bubbling up from within him. He's just lavishing his grace upon us. And he said, you know, when you keep the seventh day Sabbath, you are participating in the swearing of the vow, which is why the bride, this is the groom at a, at a Hebrew wedding, we watched the movie the other day, betrothed, the bride walks around her husband seven times. What is she doing? She's swearing a vow of fidelity. But there's another interesting verse in Jeremiah 31, right after Ephraim says he's going to come back, and Yahweh says, make road markers for yourself, stepping stones, billboards, highway signs, conducting the course 
of your heart that it should be on to get back home to the Father. He then says, Yahweh is going to do something, or Elohim, I think, is going to do something new in the land. The woman will encircle the husband, the man. You know that verse? Do you know what that means? No. Does anybody know what that means? Does anybody want to venture a guess? He's going to do something new in the land. The woman will encircle the man. Okay, you have to allow your mind to go. It could go some places that I won't go right now, but here's the point. Yahweh said earlier that he found Israel as this young woman, just in her blood, kind of broken and battered, and he took Israel, he cared for her, he tended her, he cleaned her up, he clothed her, he put on just royal robes of high regard like a princess, and he says, wow, then, then when, in, when your time for love, I, I took you to myself, and she goes, spit in his face and left. But he pursued her constantly, Israel, keep continually getting rejected. He said, okay, this time you're going to find me. And he hid. There's verses to say that Yahweh hid, specifically in the Song of Moshe, Deuteronomy 34. So for the woman to search out him is to say, let's play hide and go seek. Yahweh's going to hide and Israel's got to go find him. Where is he hidden? In the vow. In the alphabet. In the covenant. Go back to where you started. Go back to where you once belonged. Yeah, I've been there, done that. I made a little sticker. Been there, done dot. That's a whole other thing. So, Bean. Dar. Dan. Daat. Bean means to think and consider and compare. It, it's also the word for between this to that. So you've got to intermediate the relay. It's like, oh, where was it? What is it? What did he say? What have we done? And you've got to put this whole thing all together. Dar is generation. Dor la dor is generation after generation. It's your turn in the queue, as it were. Like you're standing at the stoplights as they're letting you on the freeway, inching yourself forward, and when it's your turn, okay, that's your dar. That's your door. We might say, right, it's your door. It's your turn to go. So you've got to think, hey, looking back through history, where have we been? Where have we come? Where's the history of the... Of the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel, what's happened? And, oh, hey, here we are, our generation, this is us now. And we're, we're given this inside of these words. Dan, like the tribe Dan, means to decide. It's the guy who, the judge, who, like you're playing tennis, and the ball hits, boy, that's pretty close to the line. Well, his job is to say this or that. Maybe the judge is wrong. Hey, ref, get some, eye, um, some glasses. But he's the guy who's going to make the call. Da'at is the word for knowledge or understanding, which is the door to the insight of the covenant. The decisions according to the perception of the agreement, the Brit, the covenant that Israel has with Yahweh, is that what we're supposed to be evaluating? And it's like, yeah, uh, we've been there, done that. Yeah, and we blew it. Our forefathers completely messed the whole thing up. And so we've had, at least since the days of David, 3,000 years of, of terrible world history. It was completely unnecessary. The whole history of the world could have been different. Now think about this for a moment. Look back at 3,000 years of world history. Yahweh had given David the golden age. He conquered all his enemies. He gave him the insights of the Torah. David was rejoicing took the city of Jerusalem. Yahweh made a lasting, enduring, forever covenant with him that if you walk in my ways, it'll continue. David hands the kingdom to Solomon. It's like, man, you got to hang on to this. Solomon was gifted to be the wisest and wealthiest. And he didn't even have any enemies. No battles to fight. He still built armies and he built 
gated cities just for the fun of the military hoorah. But because his heart turned away, Yahweh, it says, gave him three enemies to attack him on different sides, just to irritate him. It's like, if you do stuff wrong and Yahweh sends in some hornets and some badgers, and it's like, oh, great. He, he brought it on himself, but that's what it was. And then from there, everything escalated downhill. If, if Yahweh was designing this whole world, do you think this is what he really wanted? Do you think that from the very beginning, when he says, you know, I'm going to invent planet Earth, and I'm going to have a people, and boy, I'm going to watch them do what, man, what a great plan. I'm going to be their Elohim, they're going to be my people, and this is going to be fantastic. This is like the worst TV show you've ever seen. This is like a horrible movie. What the heck? Do you think that he built all this for what we've had for the last 3,000 years? Really? But there's a place where Yahweh has still expressed his dream, numerous places actually, all through the Old Testament, where he says, I'm going to be your Elohim, and you're going to be my people. Yeah. Just like back when we were there doing that in the days of David and the beginning of the days of Solomon. The world has never seen it since. So the little sticker I did, it actually looks like this. It has this uh, Ein Dalet, Ein Tav. It says, B'nai Israel, been there, done that. Kind of a joke. In English, been there, done that. It's like, yeah, yeah. Have you been to Disneyland? Yeah, been there, done that. Let's, let's, let's find something new. Hey, you want to you wanna do Yahweh's things? Nah, been there, done that. Let, let's find some other elephants. That's been the whole trouble. Israel is always, yeah, been there, done that. But... The way to teshuva, to, to keep the vow, is to go back to the ways that our forefathers had been there and done that. We are supposed to go back to the ancient paths, to the ways of our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, David, and do what they did. Only he said, he, you know, I can look up the verse, I don't have it handy, but he said, he is going to raise the prestige, the word is resh bet bet, Rabab, but it may mean more, I will make you more numerous, but also of a higher regard than in the past. So the way I read the text is that what is in front of us, if we go back to Shuv, to the Shiva, the vow, that what's in front of us is a greater time than even the golden age of David and Saul. That's what he said. That's in front of us. We just have to have the thought, and then he has this little matter called the tikva. Tav, kuf, bav, hey. And I think we talked about the first day, this word kava. You might see somebody spell their name kava. Hi, Yokanan. The point is, kava is the hope. Kuf is a, like you take a point, draw a line, a tight line is. Kava. You can also take this line and run it around as a radius, forming a circle, which forms a, a target. You have different lengths depending on how you tighten the line, and you'll end up with concentric circles of target. But the other interesting thing is that if you have a guitar neck with these little tuners on it, with the strings going down, as you tighten tuners, it changes the pitch of the guitar strings. That's kava. A tightened string is kava. So the word kava is hope. The hope set before us depends on how we tighten these strings, which changes the frequency. So this whole subject that we're just talking about this week, the quantum physics, having to do with frequency and resonance and harmonics, is to say, if you change your thoughts, if you change your view, if you change your words, you change your expectation, which is your hope, which actually physically changes molecular solid matter in this realm that we think is independent of those things. And it's not mind over matter. But the people who say mind over matter know that something's going on, so that's what they call it. It's actually quantum physics. It's the psalmic, which is an engineered structure like geometry, and the letter noon, 
which is this vitality, this spark of life, which is like consciousness, some type of an energy interfacing with the geometrical structure of what he built. Its molecular structure, rules of engagement, physics, chemistry, mathematics, gets into biology, psychology, philosophy. It's all wrapped up in, hey, noon samic or samic noon, how it's expressed. And so the point of all this is that if we go back and consider the container and the pure truth, the pure refining, bringing it back to the original, which is the word kadosh, bringing it back to, remember the, the Melakim, the angels around the, the uh, Yahuwah's throne, the words they're saying, they're not saying holy, holy, holy. Even though the word holy, 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 sounds kind of nice. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. <laughs> Sorry, different, different phonics, it's not quite the same. But you can turn kadosh, you can learn to sing kadosh. You can learn to appreciate the beauty of the Hebrew if you set your heart and your affections swelling up with desire for the absolute purest, cleanest, resonant of what he expressed, what he gave us which is the Ivrit, Shafa HaKodesh. That word Shafa is translated lip, language, tongue. It's also to be smooth and clean, like the lip, like the edge of a riverbank compared to the overgrowth or the water. It's smooth stones washed by the water. It also means to restore to health and to cure from lunacy. So I believe that he gave us the Hebrew language, the Hebrew letters, that if we ponder them, if we go back, there's nothing sacred about this drawing, but if you're just looking at the letters, you're not looking at those letters with painted shapes. You're, you're looking through those letters to the Kadosh Nun that he invented, the Kadosh Samik. It was in his mind when he invented those letters. A picture simply facilitates our regard. Like, to, to do a stained glass window, or actually the Greek Orthodox do this with their, what they call icons. They, they look like people, but they, they, they draw them distorted on purpose so that it's not a real portrait. It's just the suggestion of the person so that you look into the picture and you regard the stories and then in your own mind you're putting them together in a habitat and trying to be there. So from a Protestant perspective, in looking at an Orthodox icon, it's like, idolatry. From a Greek Orthodox perspective, it's a it's a crutch for walking. It's a it's a walker because we're lame and we need some assistance. Is that a is that a crime? It's so easy to point the finger, like the eye and dalit on top. Understand the door. Understand the sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant, I believe, are the Hebrew alphabet letters by, by which the Torah is the composition of them. Like. You know, there's only so many notes, but you know, you put together a few notes and you got with a certain rhythm, you now you have a beautiful song. That's like the letters forming words, forming text. Yeshua said, I'm the door. So to say, understand this door, if this is Yeshua, it's not the Jesus Christ of the Christian church. Oh yeah, they're, both names are referring to that guy who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. But Yeshua, in my mind, Yahusha, is the word made flesh. What word? The Hebrew alphabet. All these letters in human form, incarnate, perfectly, purely, purely as a refined bar mitzvah. Bar is sun, but it's also to be refined and milled to specification. If you get a bar of metal or a, a piece of wood that's been surfaced on four sides, milled down to a certain spec, of size and uh, tolerance of, of load bearing. 
That's what the mitzvot. Mitzvot is mem, zadi, bab, tab. These are two words that we talked about the other day. I'm just bringing it back to pull in a couple of days ago into this. Zadi, bab, and kufav. We read that, that when Jesse read this, line upon line, precept upon precept, that's the way it's translated. Here a little, there a little. But the word line is kava, which is also the tension of the string, which is our hope. So he says, according to your hope, according to what you can vision. It's not my invention of a hope. It's what he told us is his hope, his vision. I'm going to be your Elohim, and you're going to be my people. Now, if you read the text of the Old Testament from that perspective, and then when he said precept upon precept, this is the word matzot, which is where you get matzah bread, but also means find out how to do something, and zadivav also means command and order. Like, if he's the admiral of the fleet, those who man the crew, that's another meaning, to man his crew, to sign up to say, yes, sir, do what he said. Do what he said with the hope set before you is another way to read line upon line and precept upon precept. So what does those words mean? Line upon line, precept upon precept, there's another way to read them, just like the word shakad means almond, but it also means industrious and diligent. So. I won't elaborate on this, but if you look at these two letters, those two letters, other prefixes and suffixes, and then you just ponder, that's what all this is about. If we, if we go back and think about this, that's a way to read the letters of the alphabet. Every letter of the alphabet is actually talking about Yeshua. And who is Yeshua? The guy described by each of the 22 letters. So if he, by his spirit, tells his followers and disciples to pay no attention to the Torah, change the day from the seventh day to the first day, change the Moedim from the seven that he gave us to Christmas, Easter, Halloween, Valentine's Day, or whatever else it might be, it's not the same guy. Both names, Jesus and Yeshua, refer to the guy who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, but different character. Why? Because one guy said at least his spirit for the last 2,000 years has told his disciples this stuff doesn't matter anymore and his spirit has said I'm giving you new stuff because God changed the plans God changed the rules Yahusha says return to the ways of the forefathers it's not about going to heaven it's not about salvation it's about living the life on this earth successfully and so Yahusha is the guy that says, hey, I'm walking out the Torah, follow me. As I regard the instructions of my father and the hope set before us, he, he knew that even though he'd be put to dead, he was going to resurrect because the Zadi means resurrection. It doesn't mean resurrection, it's a picture of the sprout come back to life. It means righteousness. And then Kuf is ascension. So the, set, the hope set before him is that he knew even though he was going to be put to death, he was going to sprout back to life and ascend. Kuf is a picture of how Makom is the place, so it's here, but it's also Kumi, which is to arise. So after he rose from the dead, 40 days later, he ascended up into heaven, and the Malachim angels told the disciples, you know, he's going to come back the same way. Coming back, planted right here, Mount of Olives, that's the same letter Kuf. That's the hope set before us. The hope set before us that he's coming back just like he said, and that not only Yeshua, Yahusha, depending on how you want to pronounce that, but he is the archetype, prototype of Israel. So it's not just the prototype of humanity, so that when we die, put into the grave, het, we know that after a while, Zadi will sprout, sprout back to life and ascend to our destiny, the heaven or hell picture, but also it's a picture of, I believe, Israel. Israel was put to the weapon back when they broke the vow and took on the curse, Zion. They were put into obscurity, Cat, the northern kingdom, for 2,730 years, a blend of Leviticus 26 with Ezekiel 4. As of 2010, sprout. The curse is over. Pay Zadi to explode, to open the mouth, to open the chet of not just the curse, but the chet of obscured understanding. So here we are to understand. 
And then if we're going to read the Aleph bad as a prophetic picture, the next thing is the kuf of ascension, the hope that was set in front of Israel for all these 3,000 years since the days of David was. The Mashiach is coming. The Christians say, well, he already did come. He killed him and he left. He should come back and take us to heaven. But the Jews apparently say, it couldn't have been him because there's not peace on the earth and he never whipped our enemies and gave us the kingdom. So the Christians say, shut up, you stupid Jews. You don't even know how to recognize your own Savior. And what they're saying is, you idiot, you Christians, you've invented a new Messiah that's never even been prophesied. What the heck are you guys doing? And, and so the one pokes out the other guy's eye and the other guy pokes out the other guy's eye. So... I believe that this is, go back to, been there, done that, Ben Israel, with both eyes. Read the Aleph bet. Israel was put into the curse, the Chet, until the time that it could be sprouted back, 2010, 700 and, from 721, 2730 years forward is 2010, in which case what's in front of us is the Kuf, the Ascension. And he told us how to ascend to a place of rash dignity. Does anybody remember what it is? How do we take from ignorance to understanding and knowledge, from slaving to the foreign masters, to being Yahweh's Kadosh, Ami people? What do we have to do? Somebody's got to know. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? This is an open question. Take charge. Ask, seek, right. knock. Ask, seek, knock, and take charge as if what he said was absolutely true. Return to his mitzvot <laughs> that the church has told us didn't matter, doesn't exist, nailed to the cross, done away with. Those who go back there are under the law. <laughs> We're under his command. Yes, sir. That's the meaning of the word zadi vav. It's his blessing. It's his blessing. It's our privilege to have the insight to do what he said to be the body of El Shaddai, the omnipotent provider of all benefits and overwhelming destroyer of all his opposition enemies because he's given us the insight of the vow that's embedded in the 22 letters and if we do that it'll be fully satisfying and every word that he promised will be exactly as he said. So then you start reading the Old Testament a whole new world opens up. A whole new world opens up. I've had people tell me that they've never heard these words before. Never. Some people that are 30 years old or 50 years old or 90 years old. I've, I've asked them. They've never heard these words. So that means I could say why not and, and be disgusted with certain teachers and professors and preachers and no, it's not about that. They were under the curse for this for Yeshua to come out of the grave and it open up and that would be a picture of the restoration of the federation of the confederation of the 12 tribes he was dead and for all intents and purposes Israel has been dead but the prophetic statement in the alphabet just like he arose Israel comes back to life Israel ascends to the dignity imparted to it by the covenant which is the rest status and teeth the teeth and fire of refining fire of El Shaddai is the take charge because the word Shin Resh is Sar, which is prince, as in Sar Shalom, the prince of peace. Oh, he's the prince of peace. But the word Shalom is not just peace. It's also satisfied, overflowing, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing, everything healthy and full like it was meant to be. Like Yahuwah himself has been envisioning for at least 6,000 years, plus whoever knows however many, if there was any more, but at least 6,000 years, he's been waiting for this occasion, and we denied it to him. I found this word that means to break, crush, and he talks about what Israel did to him, and then I saw that it also means in the dictionary to break a dream which can mean to interpret a dream, like what Sigmund Freud would do. He'd listen to his patients and he'd try to interpret the dream and say, oh, this is what your, what's deep inside comes bubbling out into some neurosis, psychosis, or dream matter. But it also means the interpretation. It's the breaking of a dream. It's the interpretation of a dream. And as we're sitting here trying to interpret the, what's encoded in the alphabet, I realized 
We broke Yahweh's dreams. 